Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today. I'm Todd Becker. We're talking today with Professor Pedro Carrera Bastos. And Dr. Bastos is a dietitian and researcher affiliated with the European University of Madrid in Spain and Lund University in Sweden. At Lund, he studied and collaborated with Stefan Lindeberg, the principal investigator of the famous Catava study. Pedro lectures extensively on health-related topics worldwide and has co-authored influential papers such as The Western Diet and Lifestyle in Diseases of Civilization and Chronic Inflammation in the Etiology of Disease Across the Lifespan, which was the most cited recent article in the influential journal Nature Medicine. Pedro has presented at the Ancestral Health Symposium. Most recently, in 2022, he spoke on the Catawba study, which we'll get into today. Today's uh, discussion is going to be broad ranging, covering the inflammation process itself, the role of inflammation in health and disease, what we can learn from studying traditional populations like the Catawbans, and Pedro's specific recommendations for how you could reduce the risk or the level of chronic inflammation through diet and lifestyle. And I hope our conversation will get you thinking. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Pedro. Thank you very much, Todd. It's a real pleasure to be here. So um, Pedro, this term inflammation, it gets thrown around a lot in the popular media. So maybe you could start by giving us a definition of how you see inflammation and how the inflammatory processes function in our bodies. Certainly, Toronto. So inflammation, I think it can be defined as a fundamental biological process in initiated by the immune system in response to pathogens, tissue damage, toxins, and various other insults. So this is a complex response that involves a series of biochemical and cellular events aimed at, first of all, eliminating the offending agents, such as the virus and bacteria, for example, clearing out damaged structures, and also, and very important, in the very often forgotten, establishing the necessary conditions for repair. So typically, the inflammatory process in response to an infection or an ankle sprain, for instance, is characterized by increased blood flow to the affected area, to increased permeability of blood vessels, and the migration of immune cells from the bloodstream into the site of injury or infection. In these immune cells, primarily white blood cells such as neutrophils and monocytes, play a very important role in neutralizing pathogens, removing debris, which is basically garbage, and initiating the healing process. So we know that uh, inflammation is a very important response that not only heals, but can also enhance uh, our tissue defenses. For instance, when faced with inflammation, certain tissues like those in the intestine and uh, airways increase their mucus production to better protect us against invaders. Additionally, we know that inflammation can induce protective changes in tissues to prevent them from further damage or future damage. A good example is the inflammatory response to exercise such as resistance training, for instance. We know that inflammation adds in the growth and strength of muscle cells as a response to chronic exercise. And finally, inflammation can also occur as a natural response to various environmental challenges that can threaten our survival, such as cold or starvation. And indeed, we know that uh, various inflammatory molecules such as cytokines can increase thermogenesis, which is heat production, and lipolysis, which is fat breakdown. And this is uh, crucial for managing uh, a cold environment or a situation where you don't have anything to eat for a long time. So I think that all of these responses that I mentioned can be considered normal physiological process. So what you're describing, we would call short-term inflammation. Yeah. And you're describing right. its positive and necessary function in the body, which is very important because I think a lot of people misunderstand inflammation as a bad thing, right? 
But And so it's great in the short term in these processes that you just described of repair, defense, they're, they're really beneficial to the body. But how can this go wrong? What happens if inflammation is extended? So as you said, Todd, all of this is normal, provided this is brief and provided it's not disproportionate or excessive and is effectively resolved once the trigger of inflammation has been dealt with. But when there is a, a failure in the resolution phase of inflammation and when we are exposed to multiple stimuli, then in this case, we can have uh, multiple metabolic, hormonal, nutritional changes that can uh, lead to uh, a state of chronic, normally systemic and normally low-grade uh, inflammation that although it is low-grade, it can still produce a lot of adverse effects. So I think that there is a clear distinction between uh, this normal physiological process that I described earlier on and this uh, low-grade chronic systemic inflammatory state that can be one of the causes of uh, various uh, degenerative diseases, so-called uh, diseases of civilization. So the difference between short-term and chronic inflammation, is this just a matter of time? Are we talking going from days to weeks and months? Or how do you how do you make the distinction between the be short-term beneficial inflammation and the longer-term chronic inflammation? What's the cutoff? So it's not just time. Of course, time is an issue, but it's not just time. Because we are talking about the, uh, something that is uh, low-grade, which means subclinical. And oftentimes, it is not uh, perceived by the person affected by it or by their physician. So uh, this means that uh, most of the time we don't know that we have this state of low-grade chronic inflammation. Conversely, we can have a chronic uh, inflammatory state that is perceived by the patient because it produces symptoms, which is typically what occurs in certain inflammatory diseases, such as, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, where you have a high-grade chronic inflammatory state that is uh, uh, often, if not always, perceived by the patient and by its physician, and uh, uh, this leads to the treatment of this uh, inflammatory state. However, when we are talking about this subclinical inflammatory condition, in this case, often there is nothing that is done to ameliorate or even prevent it because simply no one knows that this is occurring. So this is a big issue. How can we know that we have a low-grade chronic inflammatory state? There are, of course, a few biomarkers that we can discuss later on that can perhaps add us in this diagnosis. Nevertheless, they have certain limitations. But coming back to your, and we can discuss this later on, but coming back to your original question, which is, is this just a matter of time or is something else that is different between these two uh, inflammatory states? And indeed, there are various differences. Not only the process is different, so there is activation of uh, the same immune cells, in some cases, there are some other cells that are also activated, but the, the same immune cells that participate in the acute response can also participate in the chronic response. But the triggers, and here, is the, uh, here lies a big difference. The triggers are completely different. We are not talking about the toxin. We are not talking about tissue damage. We are not talking about uh, often of uh, an infectious agent. We can be talking about endogenous factors, such as, for instance, molecules produced by, by our uh, adipose tissue. When we have excessive adipose tissue, and especially when we have excessive visceral adipose tissue, this can lead to the activation of various uh, inflammatory pathways that can lead to these low-grade chronic inflammatory state that we are mentioning. Then we can have various exo exogenous factors, such as pollutants, smoking, psychological stress, uh, sleep, uh, 
disruption, circadian rhythm uh, disruptions, various uh, various dietary nutritional factors can also lead to this. So this means that uh, there are multiple stimuli that are not the cause of acute inflammatory reactions, but can lead to these uh, low-grade chronic inflammatory state that we are discussing. So the biggest difference is in the intensity. Typically, an acute inflammatory reaction is of high intensity. And also, of course, the time, because if we are talking about a chronic inflammatory state, the, the name suggests it. It's, it, it is a persistent state, and also the triggers. The triggers are very different. Triggers are different. Yeah, that, that's a really key point that you mentioned, uh, the triggers. Um, although here, here's an interesting case, uh, viruses, right? That would fall into the category of an a, acute trigger. But can you also have a chronic viral infection? Maybe this is like the, the long COVID that people are getting. Does that go over into uh, chronic inflammation or is it just a uh, extended acute inflammation? How would you categorize that? Indeed, as you mentioned it uh, very well, uh, infections can uh, be both a trigger of acute inflammation and also a promoter of uh, chronic low-grade inflammation, if you are talking about a chronic infection. And indeed, there are multiple theories about, about long COVID, and one of those is that uh, there are simply some, at least some viral material that is constantly stimulating immune cells and producing this inflammatory response. Another possibility is that the infection uh, has led to an autoimmune reaction that can contribute to these uh, symptoms that are categorized uh, in this uh, label called long COVID. And there are also other theories, but I'm not an expert on this, so I won't go um, go into into this. So I, will, I, will, I won't go further down the, the rabbit hole on this, but indeed, Infections can also be a promoter of this chronic low-grade inflammatory state. Great. So uh, you alluded briefly to uh, measures of inflammation, um, and this can be useful because, as you said, sometimes uh, this goes undetected. It's subclinical. Um, you know, one of the common measures of inflammation would be something like high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, there's others like cytokines. What uh, what measures do you think are the most useful and what are some of their limitations? So every one of these measures has limitations, especially when they are used in isolation. As you mentioned, we have C-reactive protein, which levels increase in response to inflammation. And when we have high levels, this can indicate acute or a chronic inflammatory state. Then we have various cytokines, uh, the, the ones that are more commonly used in various studies and also in clinical practice are interleukin-6, interleukin-1 beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. But there are others that uh, can also be used. Then we have uh, other proteins, such as C-reactive proteins, called acute phase proteins. One of those is fibrinogen, and the other one is ferritin. And ferritin... While primarily it is a, a marker of iron storage, so of our iron status, we know that this protein can also increase in response to inflammation. And then we have another marker that is commonly used in clinical practice, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And this basically measures the rate at which red blood cells sediment in a period of one hour and a faster rate can indicate inflammation, although this is a, a non-specific test and many other conditions can uh, lead to an increase in the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Uh, and also if we have, for instance, iron overload, this can lead to an increase in ferritin. And there are various other conditions that can lead to an increase, for instance, in fibrinogen. Moreover, we know that uh, the levels of these markers can change rapidly over time, especially the levels of cytokines, which means that a single measurement, and this is also true for C-reactive protein, which is the most, the most commonly used biomarker, especially in clinical practice. So a single measurement may not acute, uh, accurately uh, 
reflect the state of inflammation over a longer period. So to solve this, it would be better to do regular measurements. And finally, we know that there are biomarkers that may not be sensitive enough to detect this low-grade uh, st low uh, stage inflammation. And one example is C-reactive protein. You alluded to this in your question when you mentioned high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So we know that C-reactive protein is, it is measured in serum or plasma. And the typical methods used to measure it detect levels of uh, 3 to 5 milligrams per liter. We are talking about the, the, um, the lower cutoff. And uh, this is suitable for monitoring, for instance, the acute high-grade inflammation that occurs when we have an infection or after a surgery, for instance, where the CRP levels typically are above 10 milligrams per liter. However, this sensitivity is insufficient for detecting this low-grade chronic inflammatory state where CRP levels might be below 3 to 5 milligrams per liter. So to use CRP as a biomarker for this low-grade chronic inflammatory state, we need to use high-sensitivity methods capable of detecting very low levels. So this is termed high-sensitivity C-reactive protein which have a detection limit down to 0 0.1 milligrams per liter. And uh, just to be clear, the optimal CRP levels are below 1 milligram per liter. Oh, this is very useful uh, background. Now, these measures can be used by people doing research, right, who have access to a huge portfolio of, of these uh, inflammatory markers. How about the individual patient, you or me, going into their doctor, either something we can do ourselves or with our annual checkup? Uh, is this useful for us to get, say, an annual HSCRP measurement just to see how we're doing from an in inflammation standpoint, or do you find that that's not useful? I think it is useful to measure a high-sensitivity CRP along with various other biomarkers in order to better grasp uh, what this uh, level may mean. For instance, when it is uh, higher than, uh, than expected. Uh, however, I don't think that uh, just measuring this once a year will be the best uh, approach. I, I think that measuring this regularly, like uh, for instance, once every three months would be a better a better way to use this as a biomarker for this low-grade chronic inflammatory state. Great. Well, I, I do actually get this measured myself, and, and it is quite low. So I'm it, should that give me uh, a, a false sense of confidence, or is that uh, should it be looking at other uh, signs and symptoms of inflammation? Well, you should, you should be looking at various other biomarkers in order to know how your kidney function is, your liver function is, your cardiovascular risk. Etc. So, uh, although inflammation, in my view, and I'm biased, of course, because I've, I've given a long time to the study of this uh, topic, so I'm biased. Nevertheless, I recognize this that this is only one mechanism uh, behind uh, uh, various chronic diseases. So, just measuring uh, a biomarker of inflammation. It should not be uh, used for you to have this sense of confidence that everything is okay. So I would, uh, I would use many other biomarkers uh, and other and, and other measurements uh, that could be used in order for us to assess our health and our physical capacity, such as VO2 max, for instance, and uh, other ones in order for you to know uh, that you're on the right track in terms of your diet and exercise and other lifestyle interventions that you are applying to yourself. That's right. It's not just at blood biomarkers. I mean, you can look at, you mentioned VO2 max, you can look at functional things like how many push-ups you can do or how fast you can walk, right? There's many different measures of your overall health. So and your blood I think pressure, for instance. Blood pressure. That, that yeah, you really have to look at the whole picture, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So one of the other, before we get into some of your research, which I think is very interesting, one other concept that's uh, sometimes 
thrown out there and is confused with inflammation, oxidative stress, right? They're sometimes lumped together, but they're different. Um, you know, reactive oxygen species can cause damage. They're, they have a positive and a negative potential in the body in terms of some of the similar processes. How would you distinguish uh, oxidative stress and inflammation? Where do they, where are they similar and how are they different? So first of all, they are different and there are different biomarkers in, to assess each one. Uh, however, having said this, we know that oxidative stress can be both a cause or a consequence of inflammation. So we know that oxidative stress can activate inflammatory pathways that can lead to, uh, when, it, when oxidative stress is chronic, it can lead to a chronic state of inflammation. Moreover, we know that uh, inflammation means the activation of immune cells. And when certain immune cells are activated, these cells can also produce various reactive oxygen and nitrogen species that can lead to oxidative stress. So it is uh, common to lump them together. Although they are different, indeed they can coexist and they can uh, affect each other. And uh, oxidative stress in the short term can be beneficial, right? Uh, after exercise, we get a burst of this. This is useful in, for example, building muscle uh, and exercise. So you don't necessarily want to shut it down. So is it, um, and yet if it's, ex if it's too uh, prolonged, it can be detrimental. Would you agree with that? I, I do. And indeed, it is the same, uh, more or less as uh, uh, inflammation. We know that when we exercise, what we are doing is uh, hurting ourselves. Let's say, it's, well, let's say it like this. So exercise can be seen as uh, an insult. Nevertheless, it is, if it is well done, it is uh, a controlled and purposed insult, which will lead to adaptations. And those are adaptations in the long term are very beneficial. And uh, part of those adaptations are mediated by inflammation and by oxidative stress. So there are multiple studies showing that uh, when you blunt the inflammatory response with, uh, for instance, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you can uh, shut down or decrease the, the process of hypertrophy when you do resistance training. But this is different depending on your basal state of inflammation. So for instance, in young people with no sign of low-grade chronic inflammation, this appears to be true and consistent. But uh, in the elderly individuals, in older individuals that have uh, um, a, a state, uh, uh, a low-grade chronic inflammatory state, and we know that aging is associated with this, not everyone that reaches an old age will have inflammation, but the, the probability of finding low-grade chronic inflammation in a, an older individual is higher than in a younger individual. And we know that inflammation, chronic inflammation, can lead to anabolic resistance. So your sensitivity to an anabolic stimuli, such as resistance training, can decrease. And in those cases, uh, an anti-inflammatory drug can uh, can uh, be beneficial in terms of the adaptation to exercise. So this all of this is is very complicated because it depends on your basal state and on various other factors, host factors and also nutritional factors, lifestyle, etc. Nevertheless, we can say that blunting the inflammatory response may uh, inhibit at least partially some of the adaptations to resistance training. Uh, moreover, we know that uh, giving antioxidants such as vitamin C and vitamin E to people who do uh, endurance exercise, such as running, can blunt some of the adaptations, such as, for instance, um, the increased number of mitochondria, so mitochondrial biogenesis. It is dependent also on uh, reactive oxygen species. And uh, it can even blunt insulin sensitivity that increases with exercise. There are already intervention studies in humans 
showing this. So, and also, also we know that when you exercise, because you induce oxidative stress, one of the adaptations is an upregulation of your own antioxidant proteins. And we know that blunting the, the production or neutralizing the reactive oxygen species that are produced during exercise can in fact lead to a decrease in this upregulation of the, the endogenous antioxidant response. So if you if you want to use antioxidants and anti-inflammatory interventions, in my view, but of course I'm just giving you my perspective, and you are someone who regularly exercises and uh, doesn't have a low-grade chronic inflammatory state, doesn't have any underlying condition, in my view, you should use this, for instance, if you compete for the competition day, but not for training days, because what you want on training days is to induce adaptation. When you compete, what you want is not to have any pain at all and to be able to fulfill your goal, which is to, to gain a medal. And that's a very different uh, ball game compared to the training sessions where you want to induce adaptation. So you don't want to blunt these mediators such as reactive oxygen species and various inflammatory molecules. This is a really uh, key observation. It sounds like you would be cautious in use of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant compounds as normal supplements every day, but maybe they should be used more selectively. It, is that what you would say? Completely. That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. Very, very good. Well, let's get into um, so, some of the uh, very interesting work you've published that connects inflammation and particularly systemic chronic inflammation with a range of different diseases. And I'm going to your Nature Medicine paper where you connected to a pretty wide range of diseases, everything from cardiovascular disease to cancer, diabetes. Uh, osteoporosis, autoimmune disorders. It's a pretty wide range of diseases. So maybe you could break it down into a few categories for us. And what's the evidence or what's the connection between these chronic inflammatory processes? And for example, let's just take some of the metab metabolic syndrome conditions like type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. What's the connection there? So I would say that we have already compelling evidence suggesting that indeed a, a chronic inflammatory state can contribute to the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes and, and also to cardiovascular disease. We have, first of all, animal studies. We have acute human intervention studies where you induce an inflammatory reaction and you observe, for instance, I'm remembering one where you induce in, in healthy humans um, an inflammatory reaction and you measure their insulin sensitivity in the 24 or 48 hours after, I don't remember exactly, and you see a very significant decrease in insulin sensitivity after this inflammatory response is activated. Also, we have observational studies associating various inflammatory biomarkers such as high sensitivity CRP or specific cytokines with uh, various uh, health outcomes such as cardiovascular disease incidence and mortality and also type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. And more importantly, we already have randomized controlled trials, typically with drugs targeting different inflammatory pathways that have led to increased insulin sensitivity and even improved cardiovascular outcomes, for instance, in high-risk patients that had that uh, had in the past um, an adverse cardiovascular event, such as a myocardial infarction, where they are put on a, a specific uh, drug targeting uh, um, a certain inflammatory pathway, and you see improved cardiovascular outcomes in those patients. And, and these are studies that have been published in very high-ranked journals, such as the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. Oh, that's great. These are really good uh, evidence from interventional studies. So it's not just observational, right? It's uh, you make a change and, and you see this. How about the connection with autoimmune disorders like um, you know, arthritis or multiple sclerosis or things like this? So we know that uh, arthritis, such as, for instance, 
rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which uh, it is uh, a condition that has provided deep insights into the broad and very um, most often uh, seemingly unrelated effects of chronic inflammation that we discussed uh, earlier. And we know that uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition, because it arises when the immune system erroneously attacks, in this case, joint tissues, leading to inflammation. This inflammation it is a, a result of the autoimmune activity, but it is also a critical driver of the disease's progression. And it is what causes the typical symptoms such as pain. And beyond local damage, we know that uh, in uh, various autoimmune diseases, and specifically in rheumatoid arthritis, this persistent inflammation, which is normally systemic, has widespread effects and can increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, depression, and much more. And this is something that has been observed in uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. And when you compare them to healthy controls, you see that the incidence and prevalence of these conditions is much higher in those patients. And furthermore, there is also evidence that chronic inflammation can actually facilitate an autoimmune reaction in susceptible individuals. So I think it is fair to say that inflammation can be both a cause and an effect of an autoimmune process. And it is clearly a key factor in both the localized and the systemic impacts of the disease. And indeed, the typical drugs that are used for many autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic autoimmune diseases, are drugs that target inflammatory pathways. So this demonstrates the key role played by inflammation in these diseases. How about the connection between inflammatory processes and cancers? That's a, a more tricky one. Uh, so indeed, uh, we know that uh, there is some evidence that chronic inflammation can be a player in cancer. It can contribute to uh, various stages of tumor development. It appears to do so by stimulating cell proliferation, survival, angiogenesis, and metastasis. And as a matter of fact, we know that the tumor microenvironment is rich in immune cells, and some of which produce and secrete various molecules that can be considered inflammatory molecules that interact with tumor cells, facilitating their growth, their evasion, and also their resistance to therapy. And we have in the epidemiological and also some clinical evidence linking chronic inflammation to increase cancer risk. And there has been already some trials with anti-inflammatory drugs suggesting that they can reduce the risk of certain cancers. However, having said this, I think it's important to note that some immune cells within the inflammatory response also possess anti-cancer properties. So I think that this duality underscores the complexity of cancer as a disease, the, with varying tumor types responding very differently to similar stimuli. So I think cancer is a complicated beast with many faces. And I'm clearly not an expert in cancer, which is why I'm very cautious when discussing this topic, and especially when uh, trying to pinpoint inflammation as a major cause of cancer that can lead uh, to the suggestion that perhaps using anti-inflammatory interventions could be effective in cancer. And I don't think we can say that at all. And in some cases, it can be even detrimental. So I think we should be cautious with this. I guess one more kind of topic around uh, biochemistry and metabolism. Let's go down to the level of the cell. Um, your your article in, 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 in Nature uh, tied systemic chronic inflammation to cellular aging or se senescence. Uh, what is that connection between inflammation and aging on the cellular level? So on one hand, we know that as we age, so senescence is basically the aging of the cell, but it can occur in uh, younger individuals also, not in every cell. That's why it doesn't show, but in some cells, you can already have some uh, senescence. This occurs, for instance, in young individuals that have uh, 
a chronic uh, viral infection. You alluded to this uh, earlier on on our discussion when you mentioned that infections can also lead to a chronic state of inflammation. And indeed, we know that chronic infections can lead to uh, the exhaustion and senescence of certain immune cells. An example of this is uh, HIV. The HIV um, can, uh, it's a virus that can uh, lead to this. So this can occur also in young individuals, in some cells, not in every cell at the same time. So uh, we know that uh, as, uh, as we are chronically exposed to inflammatory stimuli, we can have uh, senescence. So inflammation could be a cause of senescence. On the other hand, we know that when cells adopt this senescence phenotype, they can also start to produce various molecules such as the chemokines, cytokines, and others that are collectively called the, the senescence associated secretory phenotype, the SASP. For those of you who are more curious about this and can check the literature, you can just uh, Google SASP and senescence or uh, inflammation, and you'll find numerous papers on this. In fact, one of the key researchers on this topic was uh, Judith Campisi that unfortunately passed away like uh, two weeks ago. And she was uh, one of the, the key uh, researchers that identified this and has led many others to find that the SASP, this uh, phenotype characterized by the secretion of various inflammatory molecules, can contribute to uh, systemic low-grade chronic inflammation and can adversely affect many other cells. So we can say that uh, inflammation can be both a cause and a consequence of senescence, of the cellular aging process. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the biology of inflammation and some of the clinical evidence for it, but let's zoom out a little bit and talk on a population-wide level. And, you know, a lot of our listeners are interested in this concept of evolutionary mismatch, the idea that our modern lifestyles and diet put us at risk for diseases in ways that were traditional populations uh, largely avoided. And you worked with uh, uh, the famous Swedish physician Stefan Lindeberg in studying the health of some of the traditional populations, well, specifically the the horticulturalists on the island of Catawba. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to collaborate with um, Lindeberg and the study that you did in Catawba. So I actually met uh, Stefan Lindeberg in 2007 in London, uh, thanks to Lauren Cordain. So I was already in contact with, uh, with Lauren Cordain for some time, and he gave a talk at a meeting in London, and uh, because I was uh, I was on my way to the U.S. at the time, I was working with, uh, and I was very interesting interested in sports nutrition. However, I was already interested also in uh, the evolutionary aspects of diet and lifestyle, so that's why I was already in contact with Lauren Corday, uh, that most of you, if not all, know uh, because of his work with the uh, Paleolithic diet. Uh, and uh, so I went to this meeting in London, and uh, after the meeting, uh, Lauren invited me and uh, some Portuguese friends of mine who were there to have dinner with him, and uh, along came also um, a friend of him who was also at this meeting, which was uh, Stefan Lindemar. And he's, at the time, doctoral student, Thomas uh, Tommy Janssen, um, and uh, so I met both of them at that uh, at that dinner, and uh, basically we became friends. And to cut a long short uh, a long story short, um, after a few years, uh, Stefan uh, invited me to collaborate with him and Tommy Johnson in his group, and I eventually ended up uh, doing my PhD with him and Tommy Johnson. Unfortunately, Stefan Lindbergh died 2016, and uh, Tommy Johnson uh, took over his role as my a PhD supervisor. So I continue to work with uh, Tom Janssen, um, but Stefan was indeed the, the principal investigator of a study that, uh, unfortunately, in my view, it is virtually unknown uh, 
to many biomedical researchers. Uh, although it is quite famous among evolutionary medicine enthusiasts such as us, it is uh, unknown to many other uh, communities. And I think this is unfortunate because this study offers various clues to better understand the causes of many non-communicable diseases, the so-called Western disease or disease of civilization. So I think this was indeed a remarkable study. And uh, if you'd like, I can discuss it uh, a little more in detail. What stuff so so that the study you're referring to was one that he did in 1990, correct? Exactly. And then uh, uh, maybe you could just summarize what he found in terms of the health conditions and some of the relationship to disease and the incidence of disease among this population. So Kitava, just to, to give us a, some context here, is a small island about 10 square miles belonging to an archipelago off the east coast of Papua New Guinea. And in 1990, when Stefan was there studying this population, it had a population of more than 2,000 individuals, and they lived as traditional archiculturalists in villages or hamlets. And no electricity, telephones, or motor vehicles were available, and except for a few things like smoking, uh, kerosene lamps, religion, and certain costumes such as soccer, for instance, in some sanitation, there was minimal Western influence. And Stefan spent there seven weeks between November and December of 1990 in this island, staying with a local family and eating and living like Kitavans. And during this period, he and his family that lived there collected blood and hair samples and his wife helped him uh, collect some of the samples and he carefully observed the dietary habits of uh, the, the natives and conducted uh, interviews as well as various measurements, blood pressure, anthropometrics, etc. And he even did, he even did um, a, a NGC in these uh, individuals. So what did he find? He found that first of all, their daily physical activity was high, was compared to a farmer or a construction worker, and they followed a traditional diet that was high in carbs, but with negligible amounts of Western foods. And we can discuss this uh, dietary aspect later if you'd like. But uh, to, to keep to your uh, uh, question, despite their high carb intake, not a single individual was overweight or obese in a sample of Kitavan natives aged 40 to 60 years. Whereas in a Swedish sex and age match control population, the prevalence of overweight, obese, and morbidly obese individuals was already uh, high and uh, uh, very similar to what we can find in many other Western uh, populations. And in line with this, Kitavans had a lower waist to height ratio compared to healthy Swedes. And uh, Kita uh, Kitavans didn't have, because this is a common miss, uh, a common uh, counter argument to this, is that, okay, they are lean because they experience famine and they have malnutrition. But Stefan didn't find any evidence whatsoever of this. So this cannot explain the absence of obesity. And I believe that this uh, study is another empirical evidence that uh, carbohydrate intake per se is not the cause of obesity. That doesn't mean that in certain individuals, restricting carbohydrates cannot have beneficial effects. But saying that carbohydrates are the cause of obesity, I don't think that's uh, true at all. And uh, Kitab the Kitab study is uh, an empirical evidence of this. And in accordance with the apparent absence of visceral obesity that, that Kitavans uh, have, I, uh, fasting blood glucose levels uh, were lower in Kitavans and their insulin levels were also lower. Their leptin levels were also lower. Leptin levels typically occur when you have obesity and you have associated insulin resistance. And uh, additionally, we know that they didn't have uh, acne. So Stefan uh, reported an absence of acne, including 300 uh, adolescents and young adults. And this is, in my view, to be expected since a major cause of acne is insulin resistance combined with hyperinsulinemia, and Kitavans didn't appear to have this. But they had, perhaps because of their very high carb intake combined with the 
fairly high saturated fat intake, they had uh, fasting blood lipids that were not exactly optimal. However, Staffan concluded that there was an apparent absence of cardiovascular disease in Kitava. And this is in accordance with the observations done previously by European phys physicians that work in those islands. And I think that it is worth mentioning that according to interviews conducted by Staffan, and he was a very rigorous researcher, and he conducted these interviews in more than 200 adult Kitavans, they reported that uh, um, they didn't know about chronic exertion-related chest pain, such as angina, for instance, paralysis of arms and legs, sudden ability, inability to speak, such as the one that occurs when you have a stroke. So they didn't know about this at all. And only three cases of spontaneous sudden deaths in adults were known to these people in the last 100 years. So the dominant causes of deaths in Kitava were infections, primarily malaria in children, accidents, pregnancy complications, and old age. But uh, uh, stroke or myocardial infarction, those were not something that these people could recognize. You mentioned old age. What, what would be sort of typical old age uh, for the Katavans? How many so, years? So Staffan uh, found out that there were 125 individuals that were aged 60 to 96 years. So they represent about 6% of the entire population. And I think this is in line with the average model, which is the common, uh, the more common measurement. So the average model age, so the common age of adult deaths for, for instance, hunter-gatherers, which is 68 to 78 years, according to a, a previous review by the anthropologist Michael Gervin and Hiller Kaplan. And something that I think it's very interesting in Kitawa that I didn't mention is that the majority of adult men and women smoked. And this to me suggests that optimal health results from the combination of many variables. And just because one of the variables is negative, such as smoking, that we know that has multiple adverse effects, the net result may still be positive when the other variables are all um, aligned, let's say it like this, to promote optimal health. I'm not suggesting that smoking uh, uh, should be uh, even considered by people, not at all. Uh, eradicating or decreasing smoking has been a, a big uh, um, public health uh, benefit. Nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that in Kitavans, although they smoke, they still apparently have um, better health than uh, most individuals in uh, industrialized countries. Yeah, great. So you alluded to some of the aspects of the diet. And by the way, I would recommend to any listeners listening to Pedro's uh, 2022 talk at, that he gave at AHS. There's a lot of detailed analysis there uh, of the Catawba study. But just for some highlights here, um, can you just give us kind of gross macronutrient breakdown in terms of carbohydrate, uh, saturated fat, some of the things that people look at? But then beyond that, some of the specific foods, because sometimes you, you, you could just call it a carbohydrate, but which specific carbohydrates, which specific fats? Can you give us both the macros and maybe a couple specific elements of their diet? So the macros were 69% carbohydrates, 21% fat, with saturated fat comprising 70% of total energy intake which is uh, above what typically is recommended, which is below 10%, and uh, only 10% protein, which is something that is also very interesting, uh, considering that uh, nowadays there are lots, of multiple lines of evidence suggesting that uh, a higher protein intake might be beneficial to offset, for instance, uh, muscle loss that occurs with aging, for instance, among uh, other potential health benefits. And in terms of the specifics of the, the foods that they ate, so their diet was composed mainly of fish, but only about 100 to 300 grams per person, three to four times a week, so not every day. Tubers, that uh, indeed was the biggest contributor to their diet, more than one kilo per day. We are talking about yams, 
sweet potato taro in yucca or cassava it's the it's the same uh, the same term for yucca also some coconut about 100 grams per day fruits about 400 grams per day so this is also obviously an average uh, estimation and we are talking about various fruits but the ones that they have there available bananas papayas pineapples mangoes guavas watermelons and others and also they ate some uh, other plant foods that amounted to about 200 grams per day so leaves uh, uh, okari which is a type of nut uh, some uh, some some corn but only in certain uh, in, in certain seasons, not every year, some beans. And less than once a week, they would eat chicken, eggs, seals, uh, octopus, shellfish, turtles, flying foxes, pork, and also some other fruits, uh, some other nuts, some mushrooms. So this was more or less their, their diet. Uh, and something interesting is that their omega-3 fatty acid intake was not very high because they didn't eat that much fish. And also the, the typical fish that they ate uh, doesn't appear to have a, a lot of omega-3 fatty acids, at least when compared with, uh, for instance, uh, sardines or wild uh, salmon or, or mackerel. But when the fatty acids in their serum cholesterol esters were analyzed, omega-3 levels, uh, specifically the, the ones that we are interested in, which are EPA and DHA levels, were high. And their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was very low. And I think this was most likely because they had a very low intake of linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid present in the oil of most seeds and nuts. And also uh, another interesting thing is that uh, uh, they drank uh, clean water from the rain. So that was more their biggest source of clean drinking water. They also drink some coconut uh, water, of course, and they would use some seawater, some uh, some seawater, salt water uh, for cooking. So their uh, sodium intake ranged from about 2.3 to 3 grams per day. And this is not as low as what it was found in other traditional populations with no access to salt. They clearly had some access to salt because they could collect the seawater and they use some of it for cooking. So Pedro, sticking with the diet for now, and we'll talk about some of the lifestyle aspects, but just sticking with the diet, there's some things here that you've mentioned that would be in accord with what uh, a lot of nutritionists think are beneficial and anti-inflammatory, if you want to call it that. But then there's some things that are not aligned with that, right? You mentioned uh, the high saturated fat or high carbohydrate, um, uh, smoking, very low omega threes, etc. So, how do you? Uh, first of all, what were their measures of inflammation to the extent that you know them, and what can you hypothesize about the connection between their diet and their inflammatory status? So we indeed uh, measured their uh, C-reactive protein levels, and we compared those. Uh, actually, this was uh, part of my of my doctoral thesis, and uh, so I did this uh, after Stefan passed away, unfortunately. And uh, so we we measured C-reactive protein in ketavans and in also age-adjusted uh, matched, uh, an age-adjusted matched uh, Swedish population. And we found that uh, although the difference was not very high, there was a significant, statistically signif significant difference between Kitava and Swedish controls with Kitavans ha having a lower high sensitivity CRP level. And, uh, and this level was the medium. We, the medium was uh, lower than what is the, 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 the cutoff for low-grade chronic inflammation, which is one milligram per liter. So we can say that based on this measurement, that they apparently do not suffer from low-grade chronic inflammation. However, there were, of course, a few ketavans that had very high levels of C-reactive protein, and they had it most likely because of infections. So uh, again, uh... Maybe you don't know the answer, but what would you hypothesize 
what aspects of their diet could be responsible for this low uh, chronic systemic inflammation. It's it's hard to say, of course. I think it's the combination of diet and lifestyle. I don't think it's just diet. But in terms of diet, perhaps it's not so much what uh, what it contains. It is perhaps what it doesn't contain. Uh, so it's typically a, a traditional diet. So it, it's not the typical uh, hypercaloric Western diet. This was not a hypercaloric diet. There are also stuff and estimated their energy intake and their energy expenditure. And he uh, estimated that they didn't have a positive energy balance. So I think this is also important because uh, positive energy balance can, of course, contribute to obesity. And obesity is a big cause of inflammation and various other metabolic changes that can lead to the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, for instance. And at the same time, we know that uh, high energy intake can also promote uh, inflammation and it can uh, inhibit some of the mechanisms that can uh, prevent or inhibit or decrease the inflammatory response. So I think this is one factor. The diet was not a hypercaloric diet. Then it was not a diet high in sugar, refined grains, alcohol, ultra-processed foods that combine sugar, fat, flour, salt, and various additives, uh, which can promote through various mechanisms oxidative stress and uh, inflammation. Also, uh, this, uh, this, this diet did not contain uh, trans fats, which can also have... Uh, various adverse effects and can also contribute to inflammation. And at the same time, although this was not measured by Stefan because this was a study done more than 30 years ago, and uh, at the time, nobody was really that interested in the microbiota, specifically in the gut microbiota, but I think that the diet that they have combined with their exposure to the elements and to various microbes that exist in their environment I think uh, I, I'm inclined to say that most probably they have a very different gut microbiota compared to us. And uh, I would say that perhaps their gut microbiota can also be an explanation for their apparently um, healthier phenotype compared to the, their Swedish counterpart. So um, let's shift then from diet to the other aspects of their lifestyle. You did mention energy balance. So were the uh, physical activity, were they more physically active? What about um, their sleep patterns, stress, social connection? What, what other aspects of their lifestyle do you think were uh, most important in explaining health outcomes and inflam inflammation outcomes? Unfortunately, at the time, Stefan was very, very interested in diet. But he also recorded physical activity, and indeed the physical activity that uh, Kitavans had was estimated to be equivalent to about 1.7 times their basal metabolic rate. This is more or less what farmers have, and you know, a construction worker has. So it's uh, higher than what you find in many, many people who live in industrialized countries, because we know that, unfortunately, a large proportion of individuals in our countries do not meet any of the minimal required physical activity recommendations. And uh, what we find in the Kitavans is what we find in many other traditional populations that still follow a pre-industrial lifestyle. So we know that they have a much higher physical activity level. So this is something that we know for sure. What we don't know for sure, but uh, I think it's very probable, is that they had, at the time, a lower exposure to pollutants except smoking. Because smoking is also, of course, a source of various xenobiotics. Uh, nevertheless, their tobacco could be different than the one that we uh, that smokers in our countries use. So that, that could be also uh, a difference there. I, I don't know because I'm not an expert in that. And I, as far as I know, Stefan or another one from the my group 
uh, that uh, has given some thought to the Kitavan study has uh, uh, looked into this, but that's a, a possibility. Another one that I think it's a real possibility is that uh, these people experience more acute psychological stress and less chronic psychological stress. And we have multiple lines of evidence suggesting that stress can have uh, various adverse effects. And we also have evidence from intervention studies uh, saying that stress management techniques such as meditation might reduce uh, cortisol, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, and even some inflammatory markers. Then I think it's fair to say that these people, because they live near the equator, they didn't use a, a lot of clothing, they didn't use sunscreens, that these people had regular sun exposure. And when we expose uh, ourselves to the sun, not only we can produce vitamin D through ultraviolet B radiation, but we also know that uh, ultraviolet A radiation and also uh, infrared uh, radiation and perhaps even visible light can have various other physiological effects. So I, I think that vitamin D is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the various uh, physiological effects that uh, sun exposure can have. So this could be also another factor explaining their uh, optimal health or near optimal health. Then I think it's fair to say that uh, these people, because they didn't have access to artificial light like we do, that they had sleep patterns and circadian rhythms that were in sync with the daily variation in light exposure. And I think this is very important because we already have various studies, including experiments under controlled conditions, showing that reducing the number of hours of sleep or inducing circadian disruption, such as the one that shift workers experience or people who suffer jet lag because they travel to a different time zone, that this can have multiple metabolic and immune adverse effects, leading, for instance, to increased oxidative stress, increased inflammatory markers, increased blood pressure, decreased insulin sensitivity, and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, all of these factors, along with diet, uh, could explain their optimal lifestyle. The other factor that some could say is that they... They don't, don't belong to this earth. They are extraterrestrials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, I'm really glad you brought up um, the connection between stress, sleep, and inflammation, right? Because people just think, oh, inflammation is all about diet. But the psychological factors are important here. But what what is actually the um, mechanism of action? Is it through... Hormonal regulation, you mentioned things like cortisol, uh, uh, some of the circadian-related uh, hormones. What's How do you get from stress to these very biochemical inflammation processes? So on one hand, as you said, you have hormonal changes that can activate inflammatory pathways. So that's one mechanism. The other possible mechanism that I'm aware of is that uh, stress can induce uh, some changes at the cellular level that can lead, for instance, to, uh, to an increased number of certain uh, molecules uh, named dumps, danger-associated molecular patterns, or alarmins, because they sound an alarm, that can uh, activate, for those of you who are more geeky about this and want to know the exact mechanism, these molecules could uh, uh, activate uh, the inflammasome and the inflammasome can upregulate the inflammatory response. Because the inflammasome, what it can do, it is to convert a certain uh, proteins that are, not, that are not yet bioactive uh, inflammatory proteins such as cytokines, such as pro-interleukin 1 beta and pro-interleukin 18. And when the inflammasome is activated by these molecules, it can convert these uh, pro-cytokines into bioactive cytokines that can then upregulate the inflammatory response. So these are two of the mechanisms that I'm aware of, and perhaps there are 
There could be others. I'm not an expert on the role of uh, stress in uh, in inflammation. I, I I've studied much more rigorously the effect of diet in inflammation and the uh, various consequences of inflammation, specifically at the more metabolic level. But I know I recognize that there are many other factors that can lead to inflammation, and uh, the mechanisms that I'm aware of regarding stress and inflammation are these two that I just mentioned. Oh, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, everybody talks about mind-body connection, but here for all of you geeks and nerds out there, Pedro just gave you the pathways, uh, and this was a something I didn't even prepare him for. So impressive, Pedro, that you can just come up with that. Uh, so, uh, but let's now talk about what we can do in our lives. You know, we, we can't all move to Katava and live like the Katavans. They had a unique lifestyle. We love our conveniences. We live in the West. So what kind of diets can we look toward or dietary practices and lifestyle practices can we look to to minimize the risk of uh, chronic inflammation. And I'm thinking if maybe just start on a on a uh, the diet side, if you look at Mediterranean diets, paleo, keto, vegan diets, whole food diets, uh, are any of these favored in terms of minimizing inflammation or can you adapt any of these diets to a pattern that will uh, will lead you to the same outcome? So in my view, and I've changed over the years, uh, in the past, I was uh, very in favor of a paleolithic diet. And before that, I was very in favor of a vegan diet, for instance. I, I went vegan for, for some time. Uh, then I followed uh, uh, a paleolithic diet. I followed a low-carb, a ketogenic diet, and, and various other ones. And uh, nowadays, uh, after many years uh, of experimentation and reading the scientific literature and also seeing some patients. I don't see a lot of patients, but I see some. Um, as a, a dietitian, uh, what I can say is this, that the diet should be personalized. So there isn't one size fits all dietary approach. That's something that I completely um, abandoned over the years. So nowadays, what I try to do is to recommend a more personalized diet. It's not easy to do it, of course, and it's, it has to be refined over, over time as we find more evidence and we have better ways of uh, assessing uh, the effects of diet on the individual, but the diet should be personalized. Having said that, I would basically say this. The diet should provide everything that you need, so all the nutrients. I think it should also provide phytochemicals because phytochemicals, although they have uh, in certain circles a bad rep because they are viewed as toxins, and indeed plants do not produce phytochemicals to help us. Plants produce phytochemicals to defend themselves because they cannot bite, they cannot uh, scratch, and they cannot run. So plants have to uh, come up with a different way of defending themselves and Phytochemicals are one of those uh, ways. And, so we and, know and that while, we're, while we're on phytochemicals, they do uh, stimulate our endogenous antioxidant systems, that, NRF2. So, in at least at, at a low low level, not excessive, they can stimulate our own defenses. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say, Todd. Indeed, and I completely agree. So, although the phytochemicals are in, can indeed be toxic especially in high amounts, we know that, first of all, the absorption rate is low, and it is low because in high amounts, it could damage us. And uh, um, it, so in low amounts, it can induce, as you say, um, an adaptation, such as exercise, for instance. Exercise also works through similar mechanisms or through similar principles. So the, we are talking about hormesis, where a certain uh, insult can trigger a beneficial adaptation. And one of those adaptations is, as you said, the activation of a, a transcription factor called NRF2, which in turn will increase the, the expression of genes that will uh, upregulate our antioxidant uh, response. So phytochemicals can indeed lead 
to a better antioxidant capacity. At the same time, at the same time we know that phytochemicals can also downregulate the expression of genes involved in the inflammatory response. So it can also have a role in inflammation. And I think this could be very interesting, especially for individuals who have chronic inflammation. Also, I think that uh, for people who have a, a chronic inflammatory condition, that uh, an increase in the intake of omega-3 fatty acids, especially EPA and DHA, that work through multiple mechanisms to decrease or to induce the resolution of inflammation, so decrease inflammation or induce the resolution phase of inflammation could be beneficial for those individuals. And we have randomized controlled trials in rheumatoid arthritis patients, for instance, showing that uh, omega-3 fatty acids indeed uh, seem to have uh, uh, clinical benefits. At the same time, uh, the diet should should uh, avoid, should not contain the specific uh, factors that could induce oxidative stress, inflammation, insulin resistance, and so on and so forth. So basically, we are talking about the diet that provides us with everything that we need in the amounts that we need, and the amounts that we need are different than the amounts that our neighbor needs. And at the same time, does it contain uh, the various factors that can promote uh, um, uh, adverse uh, health consequences? So we are talking about, uh, for instance, uh, advanced glycation end products that are present in fried foods or foods that are um, heated at in uh, low humidity conditions and at very high temperatures. Then that we can we can also find the, those uh, ages advanced glycation in products that can be partially absorbed and can induce oxidative stress and enhance inflammation in processed and ultra processed foods. We can also find uh, oxidative lipids in uh, foods that are fried or that are overly heated at uh, very high temperatures. Then we also have excessive sugar, excessive. Uh, Salt, especially if we have low potassium intake, for instance, uh, that can also promote uh, an inflammatory response. We also have trans fatty acids, and we have uh, the typical combination of uh, flour, sugar, fats, salt, and various uh, additives that can also, through multiple mechanisms, induce an inflammatory response. So the diet should not contain any of this. And in my view, in order for the diet to supply everything that we need, I think the diet should be omnivorous. However, I'm not someone who is going to uh, tell you that uh, you cannot follow a vegan diet because you can. It's, uh, it's possible to adapt a vegan diet in order to provide everything you need. But in many cases, you may need to supplement the diet with some specific supplements, some specific nutrients such as B12, DHA. It sounds like what you're saying is don't focus so much on the name of the diet or the, the gross uh, outlines of it, but more on whether you're getting the specific components that you need and you're avoiding the problematic components. And with, if, if you look at more it on a component basis, you could craft a diet or adapt a diet that's more personalized or more in line with uh, your your preferences. So, for example, you said phytonutrients, omega three fats, some of the minerals um, are things we should include. What about fiber? Fiber is something uh, uh, you didn't touch on here. Is that important? No, I didn't touch on because I think that on one hand we have many observational studies suggesting that indeed higher fiber intake, especially soluble fiber can have various uh, positive health outcomes. We have also some intervention studies suggesting that. However, it is true that uh, we also have various examples of individuals who follow a low fiber diet uh, because of some health conditions where a higher fiber intake might uh, adversely affect their condition. And those people do not seem to be, uh, that do not seem to be uh, sick or do not seem to have uh, um, 
uh, do not seem to experience some adverse effects. So I, I think that uh, on one hand, there is indeed evidence that fiber, especially soluble fiber, fiber can have multiple positive health outcomes and can uh, uh, affect the gut microbiota, that's for sure. Uh, nowadays, there is another term that is uh, being mentioned in the scientific literature uh, more often, which is uh, MAC, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So instead of fiber or prebiotics, um, what some researchers are suggesting is that we mention, we, we talk about these uh, microbiota accessible carbohydrates, which is, as the term suggests, carbohydrates that we ourselves do not digest, do not uh, absorb, but that can be used by the microbes in our in our gut. And perhaps this can lead to a more positive uh, gut microbiota. But why am I being a, a bit uh, cautious and skeptical about this? Because I don't think that we are there yet in terms of trying to say that if you have these uh, uh, gut microbiota, you're going to be healthier than uh, uh, someone who has a different gut microbiota. I think that we, we are still a long way from finding out what uh, the optimal gut microbiota is, and perhaps the gut microbiota can be uh, an adaptation to a specific environment, a specific diet, specific lifestyle. And uh, for some individuals, uh, that gut microbiota doesn't necessarily produce adverse effects, although it is different from what uh, some consider uh, the optimal one. Ah, okay. So fiber and the interaction with, with uh, gut microbiota, that might be a more personal or individual uh, aspect of the diet. Let's talk about uh, on the avoidance side, you did mention sugars, processed foods, trans fats, and maybe high levels of omega-6. Um, what about grains, dairy, and alcohol? Should these be I avoided? Excessive alcohol, for sure. There is a lot of controversy around alcohol. If low amounts of alcohol could also have this effect, such as phytochemicals or exercise through hormones, which is to induce some beneficial adaptations, I'm not completely sure about that. I know that some uh, traditional populations that uh, seem to be doing well uh, do uh, do include uh, a little alcohol, but there are also other populations that also seem to be doing very well that do not include any alcohol at all or very little alcohol. So I don't think that the epidemiological evidence uh, can be used to settle this issue. Uh, and then it's, of course, very hard to do intervention studies to know the long-term effects of this. So I would say be cautious with alcohol. So if you drink uh, um, alcoholic beverages, do so in very in, in low amounts. Then you talked about sugars. I, I think it's fair to say that uh, we don't need that in our diet. So perhaps someone can say, okay, but I'm a tri I do a triathlon and uh, I do a marathon running, ultra marathon running. So I need to use sugars during the, the, um, the, d that event, that the ultra marathon or, or cycling or whatever. So I, I agree in, the, in those cases, say, okay, if you do that, it will be, of course, beneficial. It will increase your performance. But I'm talking about health. I'm not talking about these extreme outliers. Because doing that, it's uh, something that would not be considered normal by our um, hominin ancestors. They would view people who do that as, okay, these people are crazy. I'm not saying that these people are, are not some, uh, to be praised by what they achieve and they have shown us the limits of human physiology. Nevertheless, we are not talking about health, we are talking about uh, performance. And it's different, performance and health. When it comes to health, I, I don't see that uh, a healthy individual needs to include uh, refined sugars in their diet. And high amounts of refined sugar, especially when combined with the other lifestyle factors and uh, especially a hypercaloric diet, can uh, produce various adverse metabolic effects. And it can also contribute to inflammation. Then I would say that refined grains fall in that, uh, almost in that same category. 
So a high intake of refined grains can also have adverse effects. Then we go to uh, whole grains. And here is where things get much more tricky because first of all, we have to differentiate the various types of grains. So when people just uh, lump all of them together and say whole grains, and uh, they include uh, oats, rice, uh, buckwheat, wheat, uh, rye, etc. I think that uh, we cannot do that because uh, those grains can have different effects. And there are already some intervention studies suggesting that indeed they can have different effects. Secondly, when we say that uh, uh, including whole grains in the diet uh, is very beneficial, normally what we are saying is uh, when compared to other foods, whole grains seem to be more beneficial. But that's not the same as saying that we need to include the whole grains. Because there are examples, such as the Kitavans, that have a low grain intake, and they still do fairly well, as we just mentioned. So I think that uh, observational studies have various limitations, and uh, intervention studies that compare, for instance, whole grains with refined grains or with other foods, they cannot be used uh, to say automatically that including uh, uh, whole grains in the diet we elicit that, those same uh, positive outcomes. Because what we are really saying is that uh, uh, those studies that simply compare whole grains with other foods have elicited some uh, uh, health outcomes, and we are extrapolating those uh, results to uh, everyone in uh, all contexts. And I don't think that we should do that. But uh, having said this, I think the jury is still out when it comes to whole grains. I would like to see more intervention studies and not epidemiological studies. Uh, what I want to see is more randomized controlled trials comparing uh, specific uh, different whole grains with specific di uh, with different foods, specifically, for instance, fruits, tubers, legumes, etc. And as far as I know, that there has been very little. Uh, studies uh, doing such such comparisons. Okay, how about dairy? This is probably one of the most controversial within the ancestral or paleo community because there are traditional populations that consume a fair bit of dairy, but then a lot of individuals have big issues with dairy. So where, how do you come down on dairy? This is also a topic where I've uh, refined and changed my opinion over the years. I was uh, in the past very, I would say, anti-dairy, and uh, now I'm not. I think the devil is in the details. I'm much more nuanced about dairy. First of all, if you look uh, even at randomized controlled trials, trying to see if milk and other dairy products induce oxidative stress and inflammation, you don't find that at all. So I cannot say that dairy per se is a trigger of inflammation and oxidative stress. Having said that, there are individuals who have indeed a uh, uh, hypersensitivity reaction, which is an immune reaction to certain uh, milk proteins. And in those individuals, dairy can elicit indirectly, but it can elicit uh, a type of inflammatory reaction. But those are individuals that have the, uh, a, a certain predisposition, for instance, or certain factors that can uh, decrease their tolerance to these proteins. And there are many factors that can do that. Even, for instance, uh, perturbations in their gut microbiota, vitamin D deficiency, it's a possibility, and various other micronutrient deficiencies, and also other factors. Let's not go into that now. But uh, so uh, just to say that some individuals indeed could have a hypersensitivity reaction to some dairy proteins, milk proteins. And in those individuals, indeed, dairy could be pro-inflammatory and can have adverse effects. Then we know that milk induces a very high insulin response. And so it is uh, theorized that uh, in high amounts, perhaps uh, dairy, especially milk, could lead to insulin resistance. The, the data on that is not very clear. And there are very little intervention studies that have uh, uh, been conducted to study this, but uh, 
Some of those, I'm remembering only two, have shown a tendency to more insulin resistance in the high milk group compared to the low milk group. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is also affected, in this case, insulin sensitivity by exercise, by sleep, and by various other dietary nutritional components. So it's very hard to isolate all of those in a study, so I don't think the jury is out on, the, on that. And then uh, when it comes to various other uh, health outcomes, we have uh, various lines of evidence which are unfortunately uh, very conflicting. So I don't think that at this point I can say that uh, you really need dairy in your diet or that you should completely eliminate dairy in your diet in order to be healthy. And indeed, I would say that uh, the dairy in certain individuals, especially fermented dairy such as yogurt, kefir, and even some cheese, could be a way for you to increase your intake of various nutrients. Great. Well, this has been a very comprehensive discussion covering inflammation, covering the evidence from traditional populations, and also looking at a lot of the studies. And what I'm taking away from it is there's some strong themes around uh, what we should include or exclude, but there's a lot of flexibility, um, a lot of options here uh, to keep inflammation in check. Um, and to promote health. So uh, thank you so much. Again, a very nuanced study. I appreciate your honesty about what you know and also what's, what's not known here, um, Pedro. So can you tell us a little bit about your current research and lecturing activities? What are you up to these days? No, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words, Todd. I'm just someone who's very... Uh, curious about all of this and uh, what I try to do is basically read the literature on uh, various topics uh, that I find interesting but I'm uh, I'm far from being an expert in any of these topics I'm just someone who who enjoys uh, knowing a little more about this there are many more individuals that know much more than I do about this and uh, regarding what you asked about my activity, so indeed I lecture a lot. That's how I make my living, is through lecturing and teaching. And um, so I, I teach, and also I so I, I teach for undergraduates and also some graduates to, in graduate students. And I also lecture uh, worldwide uh, for um, physicians, nutritionists, and other health professionals. I'm uh, fortunate to be born where I was born because uh, I'm not from an English-speaking country, so English is not my first, not even my second language. My mother is Spanish, so I'm half Portuguese, half Spanish. And um, by combining that, Portuguese, Spanish, and also English, because if you don't know English, you, you, you won't be able to do anything at all, especially in science. I, I'm fortunate to be able to speak in these languages, so this will, of course open more doors for me in the, in different countries. So that's how I make my living. And I lecture mostly about chronic inflammation, about the lifestyle uh, factors and dietary factors affecting chronic inflammation. I also lecture about uh, biomarkers to assess cardiometabolic health, uh, uh, immune status, and also uh, micronutrient status, vitamin and mineral. So that's another topic that I like to lecture. And then, or on a, or in terms of research, I do research, but I do it part time because I, I I focus much more on lecturing. But I also do some research, and so I work with two different groups: one at Lund University, my alma mater, uh, with Tommy Janssen and his group. So they are very interested in paleolithic nutrition, and so we do some uh, some uh, research on that uh, field. And I also work with Professor Alejandro Lucia from uh, the European University of Madrid, and they have a much a, a broader um, a broader interest. They are very interested in various lifestyle factors affecting multiple health outcomes, not only diet, but also exercise. Professor Alejandro Lucia is uh, uh, one of the world experts on exercise uh, on the on exercise and health. So that's another area that he's interested in. I'm not an expert, but I'm also collaborating on a few uh, 
studies on that area. And also, I'm very interested on various other lifestyle factors that can affect health. So I'm interested, although I don't know much at the time, but I'm interested in sleep, for instance, is another area that I want to cover more deeply in the future. So I'm starting to also collaborate on a project regarding sleep. So I could say that uh, I'm someone who, who <laughs> enjoys knowing uh, about uh, everything, but knows very little about each one of these things. Well, it's it's evident that your curiosity uh, is alive and well and taking you in in more directions and adding to uh, uh, this this whole interest you have in, in, in health, diet, and inflammation. So thanks so much for the discussion today, Pedro. And we'll also have uh, any links that you send us, we'll put in the show notes so others can follow you. And of course, I mentioned um, the Ancestral Health Symposium lecture you gave in 2020. 22, which is a great um, source. So thanks for talking to us today. It's been a pleasure and, and good luck in your continued research. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Todd. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.